Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's, it's good to see you all here. And um, I um, want to, again, uh, extend thanks to uh, Sustama, who, who gave the uh, talk and led the discussion last week uh, in, in my absence. It's much appreciated. So, um, so I was traveling during the past week and uh, I visited uh, my, uh, the home of my son in, in New York and his wife is an author um, and there are more books in that house than you can imagine. They've had to move some of them to the attic. <clears throat> But it's, it's just a treasure of uh, literature <laughs> every time you go to visit. And um, I tend to get up earlier than other people. So uh, there's a, an hour or so in there when, when I can just uh, pick a book off the shelf and look at it. I, I, I picked a book uh, off the shelf and it was poetry by Walt Whitman. And I just opened arbitrarily to the center of the book and encountered the poem that we're going to talk about today. So it seemed like destiny. Um, now, wh why talk about uh, poetry of a 19th century American author in Heartland Zen? Um, actually, um, you know, we think about uh, Buddhism being introduced into American culture during the mid 20th century, but the, uh, there was much interest in Asian philosophy and religion in the early 19th century, uh, especially among those authors uh, referred to as transcendentalists. Uh, Henry Waldo Emerson, or Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Thoreau, um, Louisa May Alcott, all were familiar with works about Asian religion and philosophy. In fact, uh, Emerson, had a trove of books, uh, mostly written by European authors. At that time, Europeans were all over Asia, uh, translating and uh, writing books. Uh, so there was much interest in these early American authors in Asian studies. Uh, Walt Whitman was familiar with the works of Emerson, and in fact, Emerson wrote the foreword for one of the editions of um, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, his collection of poetry. So I, I think it's not purely coincidence that themes that are familiar to us from exposure to uh, more traditional Buddhist literature seem to appear in some of this American literature. The um, Whitman led a highly varied life. He, um, he was born in 1819, so uh, about a year before uh, Missouri became a state um, he was born to a family where his uh, father was a, uh, a tradesman, a carpenter. Um, there were nine children. Um, so he was born into very modest means on Long Island in New York. Uh, at, at about 12 years of age, he um, wanted to um, become a printer's apprentice and went into that trade and practiced that uh, during uh, his teen years. Um, 
working in uh, printing shops in Brooklyn until there was a, a, a major fire in the area of Brooklyn where all the printing shops were located and uh, the industry essentially failed there. So at that point, he turned to journalism. He was um, very interested in words, language, literature, and writing, and um, uh, started his own uh, little paper on Long Island, and then he worked for other papers in various uh, places as a journalist. Until about the time that the uh, Civil War broke out, his uh, brother, one of his brothers, was uh, injured in, in the war and was hospitalized in Washington, D.C. So um, Whitman went to uh, D.C. to uh, help care for his brother, work in the hospital, and he stayed on working in the hospital throughout the Civil War accruing many of many images of the brutality of of the war he um then after the war worked in government service in washington dc until um he did that for about uh, 10 years or so and and then he um, went to uh, camden new jersey where his ailing mother lived uh, to help her during her final uh, year of life. And he lived with another brother there um, until he had uh, uh, a major publisher uh, publish one edition of uh, Leaves of Grass, which was quite successful, at least successful enough that he uh, could uh, purchase a house in Camden, New Jersey, uh, where he lived out the rest of his days uh, until he um, he died there. His um, he was buried in a uh, cemetery in in Camden and. Um, His tomb uh, was one of his own design. Uh, it's been in various states of disrepair uh, at various times. Sometimes it's refurbished and other times uh, uh, let uh, go to weeds. Uh, but this is uh, uh, an image of his tomb. It's like a little house, a home. So um, <clears throat> uh, the poem itself, I, I think um, I'll start by just reading the poem through. It's rather longer than poems we usually talk about, um, but I'll give it a full reading and then we can uh, discuss a couple points about it before uh, breaking up into groups to uh, discuss it more fully. There was a child went forth. There was a child went forth every day. And the first object he looked upon, that object he became. And that object became part of him for the day or a certain part of the day or for many years or stretching cycles of years. The early lilacs became part of this child and grass and white and red morning glories and white and red clover and the song of the Phoebe bird and the third month lambs and the sow's pink faint litter and the mare's foal and the cow's calf and the noisy brood of the barnyard or by the mire of the pond side, and the fish suspended themselves so curiously below there, and the beautiful, curious liquid. And the water plants with their graceful, flat heads all became part of him. 
the field sprouts of fourth month and fifth month became part of him. Winter grain sprouts and those of the light yellow corn and the esculent roots of the garden and the apple trees covered with blossoms and the fruit afterwards and wood berries and the commonest weeds by the road. And the old drunkard staggering home from the outhouse of the tavern whence he had lately risen. And the school mistress that passed on her way to the school. And the friendly boys that passed and the quarrelsome boys and the tidy and fresh cheeked girls and the barefoot Negro boy and girl, and all the changes of city and country wherever he went. His own parents, he that had fathered him and she that had conceived him in her womb and birthed him, they gave this child more of themselves than that. They gave him afterward every day they became part of him. The mother at home quietly placing the dishes on the supper table, the mother with mild words, clean her cap and gown, a wholesome odor falling off her person and clothes as she walks by. The father, strong, self-sufficient, manly, mean, angered, unjust, the blow, the quick loud word, the tight bargain, the crafty lure, the family usages, the language, the company, the furniture, the yearning and the swelling of heart. Affection that will not be gainsaid, the sense of what is real, the thought if after all it should prove unreal, the doubts of daytime, and the doubts of nighttime, the curious whether and how, whether that which appears so is so, or is it all flashes and specks? Men and women crowding fast in the streets, if they are not flashes and specks, what are they? the streets themselves and the facades of houses and goods in the windows, vehicles, teams, the heavy planked wharves, the huge crossing at the ferries, the village on the highland seen from afar at sunset, the river between shadows, areola and mist, the light falling on roofs and gables of white or brown two miles off. The schooner nearby sleepily dropping down the tide, the little boat slack towed astern, the hurrying tumbling waves, quick broken crests slapping, the strata of colored clouds, the long bar of maroon tint away solitary by itself, the spread of purity it lies motionless in, the horizon's edge, the flying sea crow, the fragrance of salt marsh and shore mud. These became part of that child and went forth every day and who now goes and will always go forth every day. So uh, a couple of comments, um, first to address um, some controversy you may encounter about Walt Whitman. He had um, a confusing set of views about race. Um, they were fairly typical for uh, Northerners at the time in the 19th century, the early 19th century. He um, he was adamantly opposed to slavery, uh, but he had views regarding race that would, 
probably be considered blatantly racist now. So he was a product of his time. He had the confused views of race that were prevalent in the 19th century instead of the confused views of race that are prevalent in the 21st century. I, I think this, this poem may, may remind you of themes that we often discuss, themes of impermanence, themes of transience, themes of emptiness, themes of dependent origination or interbeing as uh, Thich Nhat Hanh refers to it. How we are intimately dependent on so much and that what we encounter becomes our life. The um, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, uses uh, the image of uh, something like a flower to talk about dependent origination, saying that a flower has non-flower elements, such as sunlight and clouds and rain and soil and bees and insects and air and the ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen in the air and so many things. The birds that may have transported the seeds of the for the flower to the location where it grows. And all those things become the flower, just as all these sense experiences become, as Whitman says, the child. The form of this poem is um, um, actually my my daughter in law was was talking to me about this and said that uh, the beat poets who we have discussed were profoundly influenced by the works of Whitman and and I think you can see that in the free verse style um, uh, very similar to um, for instance Allen Ginsberg or Ferlin Getty and and also the uh, tendency to have long lists of images uh, that uh, build upon one another, as is present in this poem. And the images are not always pleasing. They may be disturbing, contrasting the field sprouts of fourth month and fifth month, the winter grain sprouts, the apple trees covered with blossoms, contrasting that with the old drunkard staggering home from the outhouse of the tavern. The friendly boys and also the quarrelsome boys uh, that might read the bullies. Uh, Whitman was gay and I'm sure he uh, lived with that uh, or navigated that minority status through uh, a time in history in this country when it was even more difficult to be gay than it is now. Farther on in the poem, he alludes to his parents. And again, we see these contrasts. Um, clearly he had, um, more affection or more, um, I guess, uh, more uh, absolute affection for his mother than he did for his uh, father, who he describes in a mixed way. 
as being strong and self-sufficient and manly, but also mean and angered and unjust, perhaps delivering uh, the blow, the quick, loud word, the tight bargain or the crafty lure. But alluding to the fact that we owe so much, but also are influenced so profoundly by our ancestors, whether they're relatives or not. Um, the people who precede us, the people who we have encountered, not just parents, but teachers and other relatives and people in the neighborhood, people in the media. And then in a curious way, he goes on to talk about doubt, which seems like it might be out of place. The sense of what is real, the thought, if after all, it should prove unreal. The doubts of daytime, the doubts of nighttime, the curious whether and how, whether that which appears so is so. I love that. Whether that which appears so is so, or is it all flashes and specks? To me, uh, this sort of signals the onset of adult consciousness, where at a certain point, one wonders, whether there might be more to the more to life than what there appears. When, whether we might be, it, it might be beyond our perceptions. There might be a larger universe, not confined by our sense perceptions. He then goes into some images that are urban as well as uh, rural. The United States at that time was primarily an agrarian culture with most people living on small farms. Um, but um, Walt Whitman seemed to gravitate toward cities and uses those images in his poetry. So he concludes with, these became part of that child who went forth every day and who now goes and will always go forth every day. An interesting twist. It raises the question of who is the child he's referring to raises the question of the self as a process and not as a fixed thing. Again, another Buddhist concept. And raises the question of whether we are constrained by these phenomena that we encounter, by these influences or whether there is the potential for them to enrich us as we become liberated from them. So I've um, gone on a little bit longer than I intended, so I think I'll stop there. And we can um, break up into groups. Um, there is much more to this poem than, than uh, we can talk about in such a short period of time, but um, I'd be interested in thoughts from you as to um, what you noticed, what struck you, and um, 
after after the uh, breakout rooms, we'll uh, get back together and discuss it as a whole. So thank you very much for listening today, and uh, see you see you soon.